Hi, amazing humans, and welcome to this week's episode. I have something very juicy for you this week. I have one of my favorite humans on the show. She is a wealth of wisdom, and we are going to be educated and have our socks blown off us and our brains blown wide open with her wonderful information that she's going to share. Rachel is her name, Rachel Marie. She is the founder and owner of Thrive Natural Therapies. She is a naturopath, an amazing one at that. She is someone that I have collaborated with over the years. In fact, I think though Rachel was also a dream builder many, many years ago and then evolved and expanded and evolved and expanded. Our, our time together has been really very rich. We have known each other a long time and I have watched her grow and expand into the phenomenal businesswoman helping thousands of people transform their lives through better wellness. She specializes in well, all things natural health, but particularly women's stuff, if I can say that, Rach. I hope that's okay. And we're going to dive into a particular area that she's passionate about and I'm passionate about. It's adrenals. But please, first of all, help me in welcoming to the show the amazing Rachel Marie. Thanks, Rach, for joining us. <laughs> hey, Em. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. So a lot of people will know, but some won't know, that actually Rachel used to have her... Um, uh, Thrive Natural Therapy out of our um, facility at Pura for many, many years. Yeah. And she's recently deserted us and moved <laughs> up north to um, the amazing, where are you now exactly? Ellie Beach. Ellie Beach. She's moved yeah. to paradise basically. And I hold it against <laughs> her every day. But notwithstanding that, when I decided that I wanted to have an episode to address adrenal fatigue, stress, and the implications of women, there was no one else I was going to call because I just know how unbelievable you are at this stuff. And I'm so grateful that you are going to share so much wisdom and knowledge with everyone. And just for anyone listening, we're going to link to Rachel. You can do Zoom you know, sessions with her, consultations with her. She has lots of online programs. She gives a lot of value. So you do want to follow her on socials and all the things. We'll link to all of that in the show notes. But Rach, can you maybe just first of all answer two questions? The first of which is, if you had a spirit animal that best described your personality you know, your way of being, it's a very important question. Why are you laughing? What would that animal be and why? I think I would be a badger because badgers live underneath the ground and they uh, usually have like a large room, but roots come down underneath the ground. And as badgers, you can sort of pick the roots. And that's what I like to do is like use herbs and roots to, to, um, Great medicine. So I think I'd be a badger. <laughs> You'd be a badger because you're a root alchemist. That's hilarious. I can kind of actually sense that vibe. That's very cute. And then what would be the one superpower that you would choose to have if you could just pick one off the shelf? Um, I think I would, I would like to get into people's brains. I've been watching the um, X-Men and you know, the guy in the wheelchair, yes. how he can help to see the blocks of people and help to get into their emotional brain. I think that would be um, incredible. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. All right. Now, <laughs> tell everybody how you came to be a naturopath and why this is an area of deep passion for you. Yeah. I, where do I start? I think as a, you know, going from a young girl, I used to be that sick girl, always sick, tonsillitis. Um, and, you know, there came a point where I couldn't concentrate in school and I actually had um, a bit of ADHD or hyperactivity. And I remember my mum, you know, going to a doctor and the doctor's like, all right, she's gone crazy. Let's put her on Ritalin. And um, my mum, uh, thank God, took me to a, a naturopath at the time. And they were like, look, let's just readdress her diet, take out, you know, main factors like gluten and dairy, um, give her some supplements and herbs. And I just remember then being able to really apply myself and I thought as I was growing up, you know, there came a point where I'm like, oh my God, what if you know, other kids are experiencing the same thing. And, you know, all we need to do is change the diet and nutrition. So I become, you know, passionate about diet and nutrition. And I eventually um, studied naturopathy where we learn about the herbs. And um, yeah, I guess it just the passion started through my own experience as a young, a young girl growing up, um, not really wanting to follow the mainstream Western medicine. So. Yes, I think it's so often the case, and you, you know that I say this a lot in, in my you know business trainings, is that 
you know, the mess is very often, our mess is very often our medicine to the world. You know, what we have to go through, learn and heal for ourselves, we then become messengers of to support and share with others um, who also need that message. And I know that's, that's, well, and what you've just shared, it's very true of your journey. And I, you know, there's a lot of people out there, Rach, who really feel like naturopathy is like, not real medicine. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, there's medicine and then there's naturopathy. But, uh, you know, my experience of it has actually always been that the naturopath knows more about my body's, um, the way my, the body of my sister or the system of my entire body, the holistic nature of, you know, my nervous system, as well as my digestive system, as well as my endocrine system, more so than any doctor I've had. And much like you, I've had very, and I know, and this is not to say that there aren't amazing doctors in the world because there are, and it's not to say that we don't need modern medicine in its traditional forms. But I think we can all agree. We've probably got to a point where we're using pharma more than we should. And pharma isn't always in our best interest. Um, mm. And, and that so often many people's problems aren't actually solved through traditional medicine and actually going back to traditional methods, would you agree that the body is actually wildly capable of healing itself and that what we need to do as humans is one, understand it and two, just support it to yeah. come back to that um, symbiosis and its natural kind of balanced state. What would, I mean, I suppose what would be your response to someone who says, well, you know, I, I, I don't, I feel like a naturopath isn't a doctor. I guess that there, I definitely classify myself as an um, integrated pathology, you know, medicine practitioner, um, because, you know, in my toolbox, I've got something completely different to what a, a general practitioner have. Our main goals is, you know, ultimately to heal our patient, but we just take a whole different approach to it. You know, I look at the body holistically and it's all connected. You know, if you treat your digestion, you're treating your hormones, you're treating your nervous system because of the gut and brain connection. 80% of your immune system is in the gut. So if you're treating autoimmune conditions, you have to link it back to the gut. Um, and I feel like by taking a holistic approach, we can sort of step back and sort of see what the underlying cause mm -hmm. of it is. And, you know, I, you know, work with specialists as well to, to help heal my patient. Mm -hmm. But what I found over the years is that when you go to a specialist, they know everything about something, but they forgot about the whole bigger picture Mm. Um, and I, I feel like as you work with the naturopath, you begin to get this deeper understanding of, of your unique, um, blueprint basically. And you find mm. ways to promote healing and just allowing your body to do what it does naturally. Um, because the thing is, is that, you know, if you've got a headache, for example, in a toolbox of a, of a doctor is paracetamol and that's, we know it's only hiding. It worked really well, but we know it's not you know, treating the root cause. And I guess when we start to realize that your body's, these symptoms are actually ways of going, hey, hold on a second, I'm not happy here. And I'm going to tell you by giving you a headache, we've got to tune into our body a lot more. And I think for a Westerner, it's like, I don't have time to tune into my body. I've got deadlines. Mm. So it is putting a lot of responsibility back on us. Um, but I mean, I feel like there's a huge shift in the world that's happening it's been happening for a while yeah. and I think a lot more people are wanting to go hey it's time for me to be responsible because quite frankly the governments um, don't have our, our best um, our health at, in interest so no 100% I think they, they definitely have some interests as their focus but then it's not our health and it's not our well-being but that's yeah. a whole other conversation and yeah. not everybody <laughs> wants to hear that but I couldn't agree more with you Rachel and I also definitely agree that um Modern medicine, particularly in, in, you know, it's tree. I think, first of all, I think I would encourage the listener to really analyze, you know, we often talk even in fitness and in wellness and in nutrition about scope of practice. And I think as a society, we've even taken a, a general practitioner to, you know, to kind of actually be the fix all for all things. And that's not actually what a GP is. And, you know, inside of particularly say pure, someone will have a muscular issue and be going, oh, I'm going to go to my doctor. And I'm like, Why? Like their level and understanding of anatomy is well below that of say a physiotherapist or like, you know, go and see who it is you need to see. So if anybody listening has yet to go to a naturopath or, you know, you, please do that because if you have and an, you know, modern medicine, I believe, as you said, Rachel, has a very um, habitual process of putting a bandaid 
on the symptom as opposed to going to the root cause of it. And I have definitely found um, through my own health issues, naturopaths to be the guiding light who's always actually dug really deep down to the cause. Now, did that take work to fix? Did it take adjustments in my lifestyle? Did I love every part of the process? No, because we resist change. But did I get healed in the long term? Absolutely. Was I ever dependent on medication? No. And I think that's the distinction. Um, and so with that in mind, I, I, you know, I can't speak strongly enough for the advocacy of naturopathy. I believe fully in it. And, and I know you're an amazing one. So I'm going to tell everyone to come see you, but we're going to move into a conversation around adrenals. You and I have talked a lot on this together, actually, inside different programs that we've run at Pure and um, and it's something I'm very passionate about because I did experience adrenal fatigue in my 20s. But what I'm noticing now is that, um, well, firstly, this just for those of you who are listening to this podcast, we're recording this on, I'm going to call it the tail end of COVID, but who really knows in this era what's happening? And, you know, it, it's currently we're recording it early June 2020. And where we've been in an incubation in society of high stress and fear mongering and fear in society and literally fear of, of staying alive. You know, that's kind of been the societal focus is don't die, don't die. Um, there's been a lot of change. People have been forced to change their habits. Um, now they're forced to change their habits and go back. Like people, as you and I both know, are resistant to change. We're creatures of habit. We feel safe in, in our habituated processes. So I suppose the reason I wanted to do the podcast focused on adrenals was I feel that right now people are perhaps even unconscious to the level of stress that their system is facing because they're not in that um, automatic or, or, or automated, you know, routine. And they probably don't realize the, the wear and tear of that. But I am noticing a lot of people are using the term adrenal fatigue mm -hmm. when maybe they're actually just stressed or running some anxiety responses. And so I'd love for you to unpack, you know, what the difference between being stressed is, what adrenal fatigue actually is, how do we know the difference and why is it important that we actually pay attention to the degree of stress our body, our system, we are in. Yeah, and I think that it's such a, a great question of what's the difference? Because I mean, ultimately, I want all of the listeners here today to become aware of how they can be adaptive, adaptable to stresses instead of reactive, because mm. that's how your, your um, adrenals really work. And when we become overwhelmed and reactive to stress, it, that really is a huge eye opener to go, oh, hold on a second. We need to check in with our adrenals because we should be able to cope with the amount of different stresses or I want to build the listeners up to be able to deal and be proactive whenever things start to change. Because there's been a lot of shift, a lot of change, a, little, a lot of uncertainty, not just with our own families, our jobs, but our governments. Um, our, you know, our countries and how things are run. Um, and it does boil down to how well are your adrenals to cope with everything that's going to come in. So this is a really um, great conversation to have, particularly now. Um, so, I mean, let's talk about what your adrenals, the two types of um, nervous systems are. Yes, so perfect. We have two types of nervous systems. One is the uh, sympathetic, known as the fight and flight, and the other one is the parasympathetic, known as the rest and digest. Now, although we're talking about adrenal fatigue and we think stress is the bad guy, stress is actually really good. It, you know, it kept us on top of the food chain. If our ancestors weren't stressed and they were like, yo, Marina, look at that, you know, tiger, isn't it cute? We would be dead. So having a good amount of stress is it's essential for our, our, our lives to have. Um, so let's look a little bit about what a healthy, what happens when you are exposed to stress. So stress is usually short lived and um, really cool things happen. Now, one big main thing is your hormonal changes. So the hormone cortisol, as we all know, spikes and it comes out of your adrenals. Now cortisol roams around the body telling your body to do different things. It will tell all of your blood flow to go to your peripherals. So this is where you know you can lift really heavy in in the gym, or if you have ever heard stories of women lifting a massive cars off children, you know one of those really in, insane sh strengths. Um, it also uh, helps to increase your heart rate, so you can get a lot of oxygen running around the body. Your breathing um, becomes a lot more shallow and a lot more fast paced. So 
you, you're breathing in the top ends of your lungs, which is actually starts from here. And if you've ever had the um, sore, painful neck, it's usually because you, you're up here breathing. Mm -hmm. um, your libido shuts down, so you don't really think about sex. And also because uh, your blood is flowing to the peripherals, it goes away from your digestion. So you don't really get, get hungry. Um, another thing that happens is that when you're in this quick response, your body's going, get the hell out of there now. So it, it uses energy. And some of the energy that it, it needs is glucose because it, it, it's fast to burn. It's really yeah. quick. So you would crave sugar. Um, this is where, you know, you hit the 3.30-itis um, and you're, you're craving sugar, um, even though you've had a really healthy salmon salad. Um, you start to store a lot of fat. And this is something I'm really passionate because women start to go, look, I just can't, you know, lose weight and I'm, and I'm stressed and I keep putting on weight. And unfortunately, women would store fat um, back in, you know, the, the ancient times because we were the ones that hid out in caves and our partners would go hunting. So for us to store fat, it was actually a survival mechanism. So your body's going, Marina, I don't know if we are in a starvation mode right now, but last time or your ancestors kept safe by storing on a bit of fat, I'm going to make you store on a bit of fat as well. So you can see a bit of weight gain as well. Um, and, but usually it, it's shortly lived. Um, and, and I guess that's the biggest difference. So, um, that, that's your nervous system. That's that flight, fight and flight, um, stress response. And then we'll look at the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is when you guess it's totally opposite to the fight and flight. So this is rest and digest. So this is when you're you got you realize like oh i've got actually a, a health you know i've got food in the fridge i've got a bed to sleep in so you're actually able to look at the positive things instead of being like oh my god reactive so you become more proactive to things and this is where we want to get everybody in this parasympathetic nervous system so all the blood flows to the gut so you can digest your food properly and you won't believe how many people come to me to see me for gut issues and i'll send them home with a whole protocol to treat their nervous system. Because when you are stressed, you won't digest your food. You're getting that mm. message to say, I don't, I don't want you to sit down. You could be eaten by a tiger. And we know that's you know, not going to happen, but your body doesn't know any different. Yeah. Um, other things shut down like the parts of your brain for short-term memory. Cause it's like, Marina, you might be eaten by a tiger. Why do I want to remember someone's name or remember you know, a phone number? So you have really poor uh, memory recall um, and then long-term memory comes on as well so your, your brain shuts down for short term but you have this long-term memory and I know you, you would be so interested in this because this is where you get into that psychology and patterns because your brain goes what did I do last time to get out of danger and if it was oh I put up my wall because I was hurt in a relationship people start to play these patterns again because they they don't want to get hurt again um, your immune system um, picks up as well uh, when you're in that rest and digest. Um, and you start to burn fat as fuel. You start to have better sleep. So you really are becoming such a healthier, better version of yourself when you start to get in this uh, parasympathetic nervous system. It's profoundly yeah. beneficial. So, I mean, for what you're really saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you know, stress isn't bad, but it should be temporary. And we want to be able to go into that, have that ability to survive challenges, to think on our feet, to, to be dynamic, to, you know, physically, mentally be on, a, on alert and, and, and deal with, quote unquote, new challenges, new experiences. And then we want to, like the animals, you know, so perfectly do in nature, right? They run away from the lion, they get to a nice calm place, they shake their body out and they go back to eating grass as if nothing ever happened. And they yeah. go straight into their um, rest and digest. And, and we as humans, because we run stories, because we have consciousness, because we ruminate, because, you know, the mindset is such a big piece. So much of it is we're actually often stressed about things that haven't yet happened or we're replaying something we did yesterday that we've got no control to change yet. And, and you know, that's the part of it that I suppose I feel focus on for people with mindset but the ripple effect that then you have to help people with is as you say they're never stepping out of 
that fight or flight sympathetic mm. nervous system response and therefore their digestion suffers, their ability to connect with their partner suffers because their libido shut off, um, all of the things, you know, are, are shut off. So can we just, for people listening who are like, well, that's not me. Um, and, you know, I laugh because I would have said that years ago when I was literally running on my adrenals. I'd be like, that's not me. I'm so chill. And I, I do want to have this land for anyone listening. I remember when I first got tested for my adrenals, you know, the actual response test was, you know, it was super chill. And they're like, oh, you've got no response. And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty chill. Like nothing really stresses me out. And, you know, his response, the naturopath that I was seeing was like, well, that's actually because you've worn out your adrenals to the point where they don't respond now. You're like flatlined. Mm. And I was like, uh. <laughs> uh. Yeah. So I suppose I want to ask a couple of things. One is how do people know that they are in a heavily adrenal response or that they're running on adrenaline? Like what are signs for the really you know, blind to this person listening who probably really should be yeah. doing something about it, but is just so in that pattern, they don't think there's a different way to be. I think one of the biggest things that they can identify is, is their energy levels because their energy, it, cortisol actually gives you energy and the cortisol is naturally really high in the morning because you want to get up and, and have that, you know, that, that fight or flight, go get food, go face the world. Um, and if you're waking up tired, cortisol can be flatlining. So what I just discussed with the two nervous systems, that's really stage one of, the, of your um, adrenals, of, of stress. But you can get into that chronic stress, which you've obviously been through where you were just flatlining. And I like to call it like a, a pilot mode where you're like, no, I'm fine. I just keep going. But you're in a pilot mode. So you don't mm -hmm. have a high, you don't have a low. Yeah. It's, some, it's like one of those, how did you get home? And it's like, Oh, I don't remember. You know, someone that says that, I'm like, that's adrenal fatigue because mm. they're not living in the now. Mm. So they're actually living in this um, whole sort of the way of coping is what you'd call it. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's when you, it's fight or flight or freeze and they're just freezing. They're, they're walls up, so they just keep going. And that's a part of a stress response um, as well. Um, I know someone's chronically fatigued when you're waking up really tired because that's your a big adrenals, sign for me when um, my adrenals. You. Yeah. And funny, this is really funny. I love saying this because that's when people pass over in their sleep is, is that 5 a.m. because you need cortisol to wake you up. So if you're old and, and you pass over in your sleep, it's because you don't get that cortisol release in the morning, um, which is pretty pretty cool right that's how important cortisol is, is for the body that stress keeps you alive literally yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then so if cortisol is flatlining at in the evening cortisol should actually be quite low and it, another powerful hormone called melatonin starts to come in and, and that's when you you're going to bed but it's funny when you have adrenal fatigue your body's going no I've got to keep you awake because you're in a stressful situation. So I'm going to keep twinkling cortisol in. So now your cortisol is higher than what it naturally should be. So now you're wired and tired. You're like, oh my God, I am so tired. I haven't, you know, had energy all day. And now you've got this little bit of energy coming in trying to keep you awake. So it's, you don't wake up with energy. You can't sleep. You're wired and tired in the afternoon. And that's what adrenal fatigue is feels like in the body not mm -hmm. only that is when you're actually at this point there is definitely going to be some digestive um, um, issues coming up things like bloating gassing you might get food intolerances um, all these weird um, imbalances and hormones because your body's in that chronic inflammatory um, stage yep. and, and then after this stage is, is stage three which is chronic diseases now we're getting into things like diabetes obesity um, poor gut health, autoimmune conditions, cardiovascular diseases. So it's um, something quite concerning because we know very well where, where you're about to yeah. live if you don't look and after your adrenals. And so, Rachel, if, I mean, you know, I agree with you. I think that society probably needs to really reframe stress because just as in like stress coming up against challenges we've never faced in our lives is how we grow and expand. Training our body in new ways that tears muscle is, is, is essentially loading it with new stresses. It's how it grows and expands. Yeah. And likewise, when we survive things we've never survived or we run away, we get fitter, stronger, and we survive, as you said, that's why we're top of the food chain. But 
how can we support ourselves to, yes, be able to respond to stress, but then drop into that um, rest and digest that um, parasympathetic? Like what are some tips that the people listening, you know, can take on board and start doing if they're not already doing? The most powerful thing that you can start doing right now to reduce your cortisol, that high stress, is deep belly breathing. It's called deep diaphragmatic breathing. And you'll hear a lot of healthcare practitioners actually start talking about this because when you're um, in that fight or flight, you're, very, you're shallow breathing. You know, yes. very, very shallow. Deep belly breathing is allowing that oxygen to go right into the cells and it's changing the oxygen levels in your blood, which is traveling around your body, which is telling different signals. And it, it reduces cortisol instantly. Mm. But unfortunately, you can't package it up and sell it and profit with it. So the only way that, um, you know, someone can get, get into to tap into this is obviously seeing um, someone that is aware of it or getting an app. You know, there's many, many free apps. But it almost feels like, again, it's responsibility. Like, I don't want to do that. Just give me a tablet. But I can guarantee you, if you start to deep belly breathe, every time you stop at a red light, every time you sit in front of your meal about to have dinner, every time you go to pick up your kids from school and you're feeling really overwhelmed, every time you're standing in line at Coles and Woolworths and everyone's going batshit crazy, if you practice this breathing, every single time you feel stress, you will stay in that very proactive nervous system. And that is absolutely gold to learn. It's a, an amazing tool. It's, it's very centering. And it's actually, you know, since my girls were little, we used to call it three magic breaths. And so when they were, you know, having tantrums in their twos, it was like, all right, let's just take three magic breaths. And it was just a deep belly breath. And, and it's the extended exhalation, correct? That's what science shows. It's that exhalation because that's what we don't have time for when we're running away from the tiger. So it's yeah. not the breath in because we keep doing that too much. It's that hyperventilation, right? But that extended exhale. And yeah. even for someone listening right now, actually take a deep breath in. And then let it all the way out. Like keep letting it out, keep letting it out, keep letting it out. And, and for me, every time I do it personally, and I'm a big believer in breath work, as you know, transformative as a therapy, mm -hmm. it's just so centering. Suddenly we land in that moment. Yeah. So I love that you said that. That's literally my number one tip too, to get into parasympathetic. But there was a, um, there was, sorry, I just want to touch, like give a little hack because there was a recent study came out to what kind of breath work is the best because there's hundreds of different yes. breath work techniques. The one that showed um, to help reduce cortisol the most is the four, seven, eight rule. So breathe in for four through the mouth and then breathe out really, oh, sorry, hold for seven and then breathe out for eight. So breathe in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. That breath is the most powerful Boom. breath out of them all. Love it. Boom. That's great. Everyone start doing that. And I think like you're saying, anchor it in so that it's something that you do. Any moment you find yourself pausing, because the brain too often wants to fill space anyway, fill it with breath. And then you're yeah. automatically using that natural wired um, focus to actually send to you and drop you back into that parasympathetic nervous system. Now, Rach, sleep is such an important aspect of our healing. And I love that you mentioned before that when we get into that cycle of being jacked on the adrenals, Mm. Um, and the cortisol is constantly being released um, late at night and therefore our sleep is affected and therefore we don't release melatonin. I know that there are a lot of things we can do, blue lights, you know, all the things. So what would you suggest for someone who is struggling to wind down at night and therefore not getting, you know, the, the rest that they act, the physical rest they need, the deep sleep they need? Like what are some tips for someone with a nighttime issue? I think if, I mean, there's a lot of different nighttime rituals that I get my patients to do. Anything from getting the, the blue light blockers, making sure all blue light is off. That's our real fundamental base. So that's screens. Um, For anyone listening, the blue light is the light emanating from the screens, artificial yeah, light. Which is basically hitting your retinas and telling your um, the pineal gland to stop secreting melatonin. Now, melatonin is an, a powerful hormone to uh, get you to sleep. But not only that, it's when your hormones reset, like ghrelin, and you lose weight with it. Um, there's a lot of benefits from having melatonin. So starting with your blue light, 
putting in a sleep time ritual for you that might look like getting the kids to bed and then going to have a long shower and then help washing everything off to having a sleepy time tea to taking time putting on you know masks and then things like that I'm a big believer social media needs to be off. If anybody's having, you know, stress, social media and things off at a good 8 p.m. Um, simply because it does bring a lot of stress when we're sitting there comparing ourselves to others. We, we can't help it. We're human. We do it. No matter how spiritual you are, it, it's, it's yeah. a thing. Um, so taking that off. And if... If you feel like you need support, I'm a huge believer in actually dosing yourself with melatonin. Because mm, that's melatonin, what I was going to ask. So do you, are you okay um, for, to, for people to supplement? Yeah, 100%. Melatonin can, again, it's, it's only short term, but it can really help to support your levels of melatonin. It's natural. It, it's a hormone. Um, and coming in with a supplement can really help to rebalance your adrenals. Um, so I'm a big believer in melatonin. Um, you know, 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams for a good month can help reset your entire hormonal profile. And when would someone take melatonin? Like when should they take that, that dosage of 2.5 to 5 milligrams? About an hour to 45 minutes before bed. Okay. So, and, and is it really, oral? They take it orally? Yeah, yeah. You can, yes. You take it orally. You can get this homeopathics um, in Australia, but... I would be looking at getting like actual melatonin yourself, either that from, um, you know, working with the GP, working at the naturopath um, would be to get the real um, melatonin. And, and when you supplement with melatonin, I'm, I mean, I, I'm just asking for people who are new and the thoughts that might be coming up for them, but that doesn't then inhibit your body's ability to make its own melatonin. Like you're not. Well, we long term it will inhibit that's why you know you don't want to be on it for three months our okay. my rule of thumb is never be on any supplement either that be her you know or any supplements for more than three months because then you're just masking things mm. so because you want your body to naturally produce it you don't want to be on it more than three months it should come in very acutely for three months do what we need it to do reset your hormonal profile reset your sleep patterns your circadian rhythm and then that's fine. Get off of it and you should be regulated out with your sleep. Okay. And so that will help people go to sleep. So if they, if they can get off social media and especially at the moment, regardless of whether it's comparisonitis or just the fear mongering that's on the mass media mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. Um, so blue lights off, wind down time, you know, I know putting the salt lamps on is helpful and, and kind of really easing yourself into that restful state. Um, and then as you're saying, melatonin, what about in the morning, if they are experiencing that struggle with the kickstart, like they're just like, feel like they're dragging themselves into the day. Do you have any hacks there uh -huh. that you would recommend? Everybody needs to start doing this regardless, get up and have a cold shower. Like, All right, so we're going Wim Hof on them. Yeah, it's called um, it's called heat therapy or temperature therapy. Cold therapy. And there is a lot of research coming out about it. My yogi, Yogi Bhajan, tells us to do it every day to turn on the, the cold water. But this can get your um, adrenals kick-starting. It helps um, with your cardiovascular system. It awakens up your immune system. Um, it helps you to burn fat as fuel because it zaps the fat cells. It's, it's incredible. So getting up, having a cold shower and don't make an excuse. Oh, it's winter time here. It, it, it's you get up, have a normal shower and then turn it on cold for the last How minute. long, Rach? How long do they have to be in this cold shower? A minute, a good minute. Jump up and down, you know, get, get your hair, get your back of your neck. I'll um, definitely be jumping up and down. I'll be squealing. Oh, <laughs> you, never, you never tried it before. Um, I have done, I only do, I've done some, you know, cold plunge therapies and I have tried the, the finishing, you know, of the cold shower, but I, a minute, cause you know, I'm the, I, I always joke that I do cold therapy every day when I have my smoothie, right? Because it oh. cools, cools me from the inside and then I have to spend time and energy warming myself up. So if I can avoid freezing myself, I generally do, but based on your advice, I'll do it. What's your thoughts on like um, dry brushing? I love dry skin brushing. Me too. Love I'm loving that skin. at the moment. It, the, when I see girls um, do it, it's for, you know, dry skin brushing is more for your lymphatic. So if yeah. you've ever felt, you know, sick, you, your lymph, lymph nodes go up underneath here. They're underneath your armpit, hundreds in the belly, they're in your groin and um, behind your knee. 
So the idea of it is just to tickle yourself every morning with a brittle brush working towards the heart. You start with your feet and it's supporting lymphatics. It's supporting your cardiovascular system. It moves things through the body. Mm. I've had patients that have had like come up with boils, you know, like or, or cysts underneath their skin around their lymph because it's that powerful at moving all these old toxins and bacteria and yeast into a place where your immune system's like, finally, let's kill it. Mm. Um, it it's incredible what it can do. And you start glowing. It, mm. It's great for um, cellulite. It, mm. It's great for longevity as well. It is mm. great. Okay. So the, in the morning, you're suggesting the cold shower. What else could people be doing to support their adrenals to find the are you sorry the, yeah your adrenals adrenal gland and the cortisol to find the right um rhythm what else can we be doing to support the our stress responses what we're putting in our body is going to either um support our energy support our adrenals or it's going to create more chaos in the body so there's no one diet that's going to fit everybody i've worked with so many unique people and i found that this particular diet doesn't work for someone but you listen inside of your body, just cut out all the packaged foods, really go back to basics, increase our fish. Like a lot of us are missing these really good, healthy fats. Um, and if you're from the generation of fats are bad, fats will give you, you know, heart attacks and clumpy arteries. We now know that's not true. Um, but it's the types of fats that we're finding now are, can be quite, um, I guess, detrimental for the body. Things like uh, canola oil, um, and, um, you know, vegetable oils and things like that, try to avoid them. Get yourself some good quality coconut oil, avocado oil, um, and start using those good fats and just cutting out sugar. You're, I know that it's hard because I sometimes, when I know that I'm adrenally fatigued, I will crave the sugar. But that's a huge eye-opener for me because I'm like, Rach, where are you at, girl? Are you, are you stressing or are you actually, you know, needing to have this sugar? And it's usually, I'm like, oh, Today's been a rough day. I'm just craving the sugar. So take them as, as really good um, signs that your body is overworked a little bit. Yeah, I know you and I are really, well, we often, particularly in, you know, 12 day reboot and fast fix formula programs, you've, you know, helped you with in the past that um, one of the things that we love to remind people is that your body isn't like separate. You are not your body, but it's not separate to you. It is communicating to you all the time. And I love it when we, you know, even when we've done, you know, trained kids or adults, it's like your poop is telling you something. Your urine is telling you something. The whites of your eyes are telling you something. Your tongue is telling you something. Yeah. Your skin is communicating to you. Your digestion is communicating to you. And so much of what we think is normal isn't. It just isn't. It's actually a symptom, you know, whether that's bloating or gas or whatever it is. So um, I just wanted to back up, though, because you were just saying a moment ago, um, you know, that foods, foods are essentially a stress to the body, particularly if they're highly processed and, um, and sugar, as you said, is, is a great um, a fuel source that when we're stressed and it has that knock on effect. So is it true that when, you know, because we have a detoxification pathway in the body, right, and it's dealing with a lot of things, but stress in and of itself creates byproducts. Is that true? So we have to kind of process this through the system. And yet the stress can actually change the change your pathways of your liver. So there's seven different pathways of the liver. And so paracetamol goes down this one, hormones go down this one, um, food additives go down this one. When you're stressed, your body goes, I don't know if she's been bitten by a snake, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purge out my poison pathways. So it actually blocks these pathways that are really important to um, detoxify our old synthetic hormones, particularly if you're on the pill, um, uh, things like paracetamols, alcohol, all those types of things are, you know, are really blocked up and you're purging out these different pathways. Yeah. And that it, itself can play a huge toll on the toxicity of the body. Yes. It, that's kind of what I was trying to ask is that, you know, when we're stressed, essentially our ability to process all of the other things, like you said, like to burn fat, it becomes yeah. a lower priority because the system when we're stressed is actually saying we could die what yep. do we need to do to not die? And that obviously, for good reason, will become priority numero uno. Yeah. So we've talked about breathing. We've talked about getting into a good sleep habit. We've talked about cold showers. Um, and from what I'm hearing around nutrition, you're saying to really minimize human interference in the food and go low sugar. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what would be, if, have you got two others? Maybe, I mean, these are great tips and if people apply them, I know they're going to see shifts, but what else could people be doing to really start to get a handle on this very important aspect of minimizing your body's perception of its stress response? I think I remember one of the biggest things when I did actually come and work with you and, and you sort of helped me to identify where these stresses were coming from. Mm. And you walked me through it in a way that I can have a look at these stresses and go, I'm actually not dying. Even though the stress is there, you helped me to identify uh, the stress and the feeling that I feel. Mm. And I think by recognizing what, what I was stressing about, helped me one, to go, I'm, I can still feel that emotion and I'm still alive. But two, go, well, what other, how can I perceive this stress in a different way? Because it all is perception. Yep. I find driving really stressful. Like I, I just, it makes me a bit anxious. It, you know, I, I hate it really. There's one thing in life I just hate doing is driving. But you ask my partner, he loves driving. It's freedom. We can, we can travel, we can go. Hmm. Same thing, just different perception. So when we start to identify the stresses, we can then re realign our perception on those particular stresses. And that really does coming down to working with a life coach, mm. like you know Marina and, and other people as well to go and step you through it because it can be really uncomfortable to talk about these things that create stress. So when you're guided through it, I think that really helps a lot of my patients to, to get through their stress and, and be proactive and then be different when they perceive it differently. Yeah, I agree with you, obviously, Rachel. Um, I'm very big on that. And I always quote Marianne Williamson, who has often said, you know, a miracle is just a change in perspective. And, yeah. you know, we just create stories and rules around how life should work. And, and then we get very attached to them. And when they are broken in the perception of our mind, it is coded in our system as a near-death experience. So if it doesn't, you know, if we don't get to be right about how it should go, then we literally start to have these very animal responses. All the things you've talked about, the blood going to the extremities, the heart rate going up, and the system is responding as if you're going to die. But with, with taking a step back and viewing objectively the situation, we can go, well, actually, that just isn't the case. This is an unnecessary response. So stress isn't something, it is a natural part of life. And it's a great, as you said, at the very top of it, it is a necessary and beneficial response that our body has, but it does not need to be something that you experience constantly and without permission. You know, there are times where it's appropriate to be stressed and there are times where it's appropriate to say, I am experiencing, you know, stress at the moment. I'm worried about this and, and talking it through can help. Um, but I do love that we get the opportunity, one, to be conscious and curate and work out uh, and sort of step ourselves through, if you will, those processes. Yes. Is this, is this really life or death? Does this matter in a week? Does it matter in a year? All of the kinds of you know, empowering questions we can ask ourselves, how could this be a benefit to me? All of those things can be asked. Yeah. And we also get to be in the reality that we live in a body, you know, which is where you come in. So how is my body responding? Can I put my hand on my heart and my belly and breathe? Can I physically be with myself through this emotional state? Um, can I get myself a big glass of water and, and just flush that through instead of reaching for a coffee, which might add to the adrenal response and get me more jittered and more wired and, you know, and more wired and tired, which is a really, really, that's, that's absolutely where I was in my twenties um, for sure. Mm. And where I have a tendency to go to when I get to yang, do, 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 you know, energy. So I, I'm a big believer too in practices like yin yoga or even dynamic goddamn yoga. If you're normally someone who's doing, you know, high energy, something else. And it's, it's like degrees. And if you move towards it, so, you know, lying in the sun, finding physical somatic practices, dancing in your body, having an orgasm, caressing mm -hmm. your lover or holding your child and stroking their hair. Like there are things that are coded in our bodies to bring us into a, a sense of safety. I mean, you know, if you think about it logically, and I believe there's a lot to be said for just common sense logic, right? Like the last thing you would do in a real fight or flight situation is start dancing or laughing or lying down with a loved one and stroking them. And so when you do do that in your body, even in times where maybe life is a little hectic, you are also still coding for your system. We're okay because look what we're doing right now. And the system doesn't know anything different than what we tell it to notice. So even though the mind might be running away with all of these crazy thoughts, you can utilize the body 
as well as, you know, at the same time as we can calm the mind to calm the body, we can use the body to calm the mind and distract it um, because we're neither of them, but we have both of them as amazing tools. So what's your favorite go-to for somatic um, slowing and centering? Cause I know you do some wonderful practices. I definitely breath work is, is number one. I always reach for that in my toolbox, breath work. I've become a huge advocate for a, um, a yoga class or a yoga technique called Kundalini yoga. Yes. And Kundalini yoga, it works on the different chakras and it's all about balance, but they use a combination of mantras, um, breath work and different, um, you know, meditations. You might be doing a move like this for, you know, two minutes and it, it, it's, it's always inwards. You do a lot of the class with your eyes shut and going inwards and, and repeating different mantras in, in, in the mind. So I've actually turned to this um, practice of yoga for me and it teaches you to put anchors in during the day. So one of them's breath, um, music. We are so deeply as humans connected to music, but there's particular music that have different vibrational frequencies that can mm. go through you and calm yourself down. And when you're playing these different mantras during the day, you're just in this total state of bliss and you can't put your finger on it, but you're just vibrating on a higher frequency. And mm. I feel like anchoring, putting that into my life has, has helped me personally um, a lot, just not just with me personally, but in my relationships, my career, different mantras have different mm. vibrational frequencies, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, so that's something that I've been doing. And I also have, um, I, I open up time for me to stop and pause during the day. Um, and I do meditation. So I have an awesome playlist that I give to my patients on Spotify. And it, it's about 15 minutes long for each one. And it's just a, a woman going, take a deep breath in, hold, breathe out. But when you start to add this in, you almost get into this nice blissful state where mm -hmm. you can go back to work. You're more focused, you're more energized just within 15 minutes instead yeah. of, you know, that's the same time as going down the road to get a cup of coffee. Yes. So adding, adding some different mantras and meditations is powerful. Very, very powerful. Yeah. I think that's so important for people to really realize that, you know, calmness doesn't, it's not like you need to go and be a Zen Buddha on a mountain or go and do a three month retreat where you give up your worldly possessions and all you do is um, for a day, you know, I, I totally agree. And equally, I think for those of us that are heavily resistant and I, you know, I put my hand up as someone who was heavily reformed from being very much in her monkey mind, very much, you know, a power control free do, do, do person. So I can really speak to this and anyone listening, I know sometimes mm -hmm. you're like, I'm just not going to do that. I don't want to do that. So just also maybe inquire within yourself. What is it that I'm afraid of will be true about me or will happen in my life if I stop? What am I really afraid will happen? Because that's actually what you're resisting. It's not the meditation. It's the story that you'll let someone down. It's the story that you'll lose control. It's the story. And there's something there for you that if you unpack, life will change. Like really get curious. If you're listening to this and you're like, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. not going to do it. That's cool. Totally fine. So therefore get curious about why you're so resistant, because that's actually the greatest gift you could unpack right now is why do I not want to be different than I am, even though the way I am maybe, maybe isn't serving me fully. That and, you know, you and I talk about this a lot, but being open to new experiences is literally how we get to cultivate the most epic life because it's like going to a restaurant. If we're not open to trying new things, we could literally miss the tastiest thing on the menu if we yeah. think we know what the best food is there, right? Yeah. So, Rach, what would you say, you know, you're, you know, really, um, I'm, like I suppose a medicine woman with the herbs and the tonics and the things that you get to create, but... Yeah. You mentioned fat before, and I know that that is a very important sugar stabilizer, like having healthy fats in the diet. Um, and you said to stay away from um, vegetable fats. And, and so I'm assuming you want people to be having 
what is it, omega sixes and three? Like, can tell us what you want us to be having, and also what would be something that people could add in that maybe they haven't thought about. And again, go and see a professional. But just some things that gen generally are serving most people. Knowing that you're not prescribing, I understand that's what yeah. I want you to. Do. Well, I would uh, like to talk that. like a little bit on food, but definitely adaptogenic herbs because they are available and like at every pharmacy now. So I want you guys to be aware of what qualities to go for because. You know, we all need to have support and adaptogenic herbs are amazing. Really, really good. For so before you continue on that, Rach, can you unpack what an adaptogenic herb is for any listener who's never heard that phrase? Yeah, sure. So pretty much it helps you to adapt to stress. So before I mentioned that when you're in that fight or flight, whenever you're exposed to stress, you're very reactive. You know, you react to it very quickly. You're quite overwhelmed. But when you're in that uh, parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest, you're proactive. So when someone says you now need to do vaccinations and your kids are at home for school, you can be proactive and respond to it from the higher, the higher purpose, from a higher, you know, self. Um, and adaptogenic herbs help you adapt to daily stress. Okay. So they can keep your cortisol low, or if you're adrenally fatigued and you need that extra oomph, they can help support your adrenals. So they're very, very good um, to help to adapt to stress. Um, and these, one of my favorite herbs is withania. Um, it's also known as ashwagandha. Um, but one gram of withania per day can help you to become adaptive. They've also um, helps to regulate your blood sugar levels. They helps to increase your libido. It helps to support digestion, helps support your immune system. The main reason why it helps holistically is because it's really supporting your adrenals. So it's supporting that. Mm. Um, I love the new mushrooms that are coming out as well. You know how people are doing coffee and mixing um, lion's mane and yes. reishi and things like that. I really do like mushrooms because mushrooms, particularly for a lot of people are changing to a lot of patients that I'm seeing is all going vegan. You know, they're all jumping on that vegan bandwagon, which is, which is fine. But for all of us, we can all start to increase our mushrooms. And they're not an animal and they're not a plant. They're in this own kingdom called fungi. And humans have been having mushrooms for millions of years. You know, they're older than what we are. So we have included them in our diet and they help us to adapt. They help us, you know, they're anti anti tumor, anti cancerous. They have got profound benefits for us. So you jump on the mushroom bandwagon as well. And what would you say to someone who's like, well, I know they're a fungi and I've got candida. So are they okay for me to have if I've got candidiasis? Yes, definitely. So I guess candida, if they're, they're some, from the same family, it's like bacteria, and then you branch out to different bacteria, fungi, and then there's literally thousands of different um, funguses. Um, it doesn't work the same. It, and they, they have constituents that actually benefit for humans. They don't okay. get in and overgrow like like fungi um, do. So they're it doesn't not, feed candida is what you're saying. No, and they're no. not opportuni opportunistic. You know how opportunistic yes. bacteria would adhere to your gut wall and start taking over? Mushrooms don't work like that, but they're candida polite. does. Pardon? I said they're polite. Yeah. <laughs> they're very well-mannered nice. adaptogens. <laughs> yes, very good. We will have the mushrooms <laughs> in the house because they have manners. Um, okay, so mushroom, mushrooms and ashwagandha, or um, you called it initially with... Withania. Withania, thank you. We call it Yeah, withania. I know it is ashwagandha, so withania. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for that hot tip. All right, well, I want us to start wrapping up now, but what would be, do you think, I mean, you've kind of said it, but I, just if there's something else, what would be the number one thing that you would say to people who are feeling... Um, like, yeah, life's a little hectic and they're feeling stretched and strained and they, what would be the first step you would recommend that they take to elevate their energy and decrease that, that stress response? Work with someone, you know, mm. you don't have to do it all by yourself. And, Beautiful. you know, sometimes we can be trying to treat ourselves and, and doctor, you know, Dr. Google is like the best doctor because everybody has something wrong with them. Um, don't feel like you're on this journey mm. by yourself because you're not, you know, we've got practitioners here like myself, like Marina, that can help you holistically. Mm. And no matter where you're at with, um, you know, your diet, nutrition, or where you feel like you're at health wise, if you're 
confused or you don't know where to go, reach out to someone because we are here. We mm. want to help. This is our life purpose to, to come and help and serve. So don't do it, don't do it on, your, on your own. Come out and get practitioners, practitioners like Marina and I to help you on your journey. And Rach, I think that's really good advice because what that really also says is remember that you're bio-individual because what, what fixed somebody's situation won't automatically fix yours. So the reason I love that you're saying come to an expert like a naturopath and get get your tests, understand your baseline because you know, and I know you and I are very passionate about baselines and doing testing because my baseline might actually be your high level or vice versa. And so we're not comparing apples and apples and you need to look at your unique universe and then work with it accordingly. Yeah. And, I, and so I think that's really important. That's probably the best advice that we could give is if you feel like there's an opportunity for enhancement, go see someone, get your tests, talk about your symptoms and begin the journey, which it is. It absolutely is a journey and it doesn't get fixed overnight. And really it's not even about fixing. It's just enhancing and upgrading and enhancing and upgrading. And then, you know, the, once you get on that, it's, it's such an amazing journey because all that waits for you is even more energy, even more vitality, you know, and we start to thrive as your business is called, which is perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And you're, you're worth every single investment that you put into yourself. And, you know, by helping to build you up and, and make you the most, you know, optimal health ever, and physically, mentally and emotionally, then you get to shop for other people. So it, it's yeah. just this on effect as well. So definitely, you know, go, go ask for help. You know, we, we're here. So. Uh, I agree. And just on that, I know a lot of people will be like, Oh, it's expensive though. And all these herbs are expensive and medic, you know, natural medi medicines are expensive and naturopaths are expensive or whatever else. And all I really want to have you sit with, if that's where you are around investing in health professionals is how cost effective is illness? You know, like really, let's think about that. We often think, oh, it costs money to get healthy. Healthy food is expensive. Well, one, shortening your lifespan maybe doesn't cost a lot of money, but it costs you in opportunities. And two, um, illness costs more, far more in the long run. Um, yeah, so just you are, I agree with you, Rach, and I'm going to second and, and, and echo that. You are worth the investment mm -hmm. to have your body thrive, your mind thrive, your whole system thrive. You are worth that investment and everybody in your life benefits and the ripple effect is very real. So on that note, um, we're going to link to everything Rachel has to share. And um, Rachel, is there a, a book or a guide for people who wanted, you know, who love to do research? Is there one in particular that you think stands out as a, as like a, great guide on particularly adrenals or stress? I really like uh, Dr. Libby Weaver. I knew you were going to say her because you know I'm a girl crushing. Yeah. I love Libby. I, think I she have is just most such of her books. Um, she has all types and um, I can't think of one. I think they're still down in Brizzy, but she has one on hormones. Um, is it Russian woman syndrome? Yes, that's yeah. it. And she's actually got a really funny um, video on it. Yeah. On, it's free on YouTube. Yeah, um, so Google she's amazing. Watch. She Let is me, amazing. You know, yeah, and she goes, she dives deeper into yeah. things like coffee and adrenals and burnout. Yeah. And she's so funny and we can all relate yeah. to her. Yeah, she no, I love her. Great. I love her so much. And just on that, for someone who is stressed, would you suggest getting off the caffeine or reducing it? <laughs> Definitely reducing it. I mean, if you're adrenally fatigued, you're not doing your adrenals any better. Um, at least one coffee per day is, is shown to have, you know, benefits, cardiovascular health and, and brain health. Any more than one per day, you're sort of using it then as a drug. As a crutch, yeah. Yeah. So um, one per day, I always say. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, and as I said, we'll link to everything um, that you have on offer. And thank you so much though, for sharing your wisdom today. You know, I love you, love you, love you. And, um, and I'm so grateful for all the work and the tireless amounts of knowledge and wisdom that you just give and give and give and share with the world. Thank you. Thank you, Rach. I love you. Um, and I will see you really soon. Thanks for coming on the show today. Love you, Em. Thank you for having me.